Hello there and welcome to Travels with Geordie. If this is your first visit, my name is Peter Knowles and I live on this classic wooden motor cruiser here in Victoria, British Columbia, along with the loving memory of my pup Geordie, all the while fixing it up for some pretty ambitious cruising someday. If that's the sort of thing you might find interesting, please consider sticking around and subscribing. I'd love to have you. Well, if I'd only got around to shooting this a couple of hours ago, it would have been bright sunshine. Yes, it's only been a couple of days and the snow is all gone. But here we have the few wisps of snow coming on, so you never can tell. In fact, apparently we're in for another blizzard. Well, what's up this week in terms of actual getting stuff done? More wiring. Wiring, wiring, and more wiring. I really have to get this done. And in fact, a <laughs> little surprise extra bit of wiring had to be done. <laughs> and yes, yes, so interesting that last week's episode was all about staying warm and installing the new main breaker for the AC circuit. Well, flashback forward, whichever way you want to look at it, to New Year's Eve, and well, this happened. Well, any of you who are familiar uh, with boating, and uh, certainly live aboard boating, and using lots of power, every once in a while, if you're irresponsible, read me, um, you don't keep the terminals clean and you consistently draw 28-ish mm, amps and eventually one of the conductors just lets go by having just the slightest bit of um, resistance, in other words a bad connection. As soon as that bad connection starts, it starts to draw a lot of current through there and voltage and uh, when the voltage is dropped across the bad connection, heat starts, heat starts, it just gets worse and worse. And well, you can imagine what the plug looks like. Or the, actually, this is the female end of the wire, uh, same deal altogether. Okay, now happily, for the shore power of the boat side, this Hubble style, I don't know what brand they are now, uh, are available in just a replacement insert. So that was relatively reasonable. I did have to wait till the 4th of January to be able to buy it though. Um, this particular shore power cable is a um, complete molded one. It's not... Um, repairable doesn't come apart well of course it's compare uh, repairable i'll just cut it and i'm going to put on shamefully for now a relatively cheap quality non-weatherproof um connector for that basically because it's all i can really justify right now because very soon i'm going to buy a new shore power cord uh but not just yet and this one will be uh, delegated to an extension cord mostly for use in the yard when i'm hauling out anyway what i need to do right now is just get power back on the boat and be careful i'm not going to show you all this it's just putting connectors on i just wanted to share my <coughs> foolishness but before we move on, I do want to wrap up with my whole indiscretion with the shore power cable, and it was an indiscretion. Shore cables of this variety are rated 30 amps, but not continuous. Now, different manufacturers made different specs. I don't want to get into the particulars of it, but look it up. Being able, or feeling you're able to continuously suck 30 amps off those uh, connectors is foolish. In fact, as you can see the results. Now, I probably also let that one get dirty and old and the connections might have been loose. There's all kinds of reasons that happens. But every year, every marina I've ever been in, there's two or three serious burnouts on shore power cables and sometimes there's fires. So I, I want to discuss it with a degree of seriousness. Um, I don't want to be flippant about it. It's dangerous. And I don't know what the duty cycle range is. I'm going to look it up. I would think probably 25 amps max, you know, continuous. The point is, I don't believe those connectors are um, really suitable for 30 amps. They're actually quite small. They don't really lock when you twist lock them. And I do want to point out that there is a another plug. Is it a better plug? I don't know. It's called the smart plug. It was designed to alleviate some of these problems and I'm not a proponent of it. I have nothing to do with them. Uh, there's one on MV Zephyrus and it's been running flawlessly. They're expensive and they still only solve the problem at the boat end. It doesn't solve the problem at the marina end because 30 amp twist lock is ubiquitous in marinas. So is it a good thing to do? Probably. Uh, they're very expensive. I just didn't have the opportunity to switch to it this time, but I may in future. Anyway, one last thing to say about um, high current electrical connections. Well, connections in any um, uh, rough environment is a little bit of silicone grease. So on the blades of the plug before I put it back together, as well as the one outside, keep a liberal amount of silicone grease on there and open them up regularly and have a look at them and see if they're staying clean and making good contacts. Even better, make sure the screws are staying tight because the way wires, just twisted wire into a uh, screw 
uh, clamp terminal, you'd be surprised how much more you can twist on that after six months in service and get it tighter and tighter. And I believe that may be where some of these failures happen. Anyway, enough said. Be careful with shore power. All right, so that's that sorted all wired up and I left enough slack on the cables here so that I can pull this whole assembly out because as you can see, this is an area of congestion that I desperately need to work on. In fact, it's where I'm going to start this week's work. Ugh. All right then, so diving into this, of course, is a mess under there, but to be perfectly honest, <sighs> everything under here isn't all that tidy either. I can, I can show you, uh, no, I'll d dive right into it. The other thing is, some of you know, I want to refinish this uh, brass panel again because I kind of botched it and it looks horrible and I'm not even sure I know what I'm going to do with it, but to achieve the patina I was kind of had in my head, maybe a little more complex than I thought. You know, I don't actually hate that look. <laughs> I know what you're saying, Peter, that's just nasty random orbital scratchiness, but I kinda like it. And finish up with scotch bright. My favorite towel. Well, there we go, just a little more snow. I was up half the night clearing snow off the canopies, uh, being a little bit concerned about weight so high. Uh, technically, we got something around six inches, although it doesn't really look like it now because it got pretty mild in the night. Anyway, <laughs> this is like my old life. Honestly, I don't mind. Just go away now. All right then, well, with four coats of tunnel oil on here, this is pretty much ready to be uh, reassembled. Now, <laughs> I continue to acknowledge that um, tunnel oil may not be the best solution for this, um, but I've done quite a bit of research and apparently tunnel oil is an excellent metal finish, so we'll see. I've used it on tools in the past and it's worked just fine, so we'll see how this holds up. Uh, the nice thing about it, I can actually always rub a little more on around everything uh, once it's all installed. Okay. With putting the switches back in, a uh, little trick I may have shared with you before, if you want to be able to get them reasonably tight, if the switch you're using has a uh, back nut as a hex nut and the front nut as a knurled nut. Swap them around. Um, I really don't mind the look of a hex nut up front. Plus, you have the ability to tighten it reasonably. And when you're tightening that nut, another neat trick is to take a socket, but so you don't scratch up the surface of the panel. Just put a piece of masking tape over the end and then that'll allow you to wind that right down good and tight without any chance of marring the panel. Uh, when these are all done and aligned properly, I'll actually use the ratchet on it to get them good and tight because I hate a loose switch. And here's the final tightening. I have swapped out um, two of the switches for um, uh, momentary spring return switches uh, because they're really should be push buttons and I'd love to get some more of the push buttons that I uh, used here uh, for the engine control but I can't find them anyway this one and this one are returned because this is the horn and this is the windshield wash um, now of course that's functional like that but I would actually prefer push buttons but I'll be able to swap them out later okay time to get this back on the hill okay then there's a lot of wires here uh, some of you will remember when this first went together, I started to set up a little bit of a system. Uh, however, uh, to get cruising last summer, I had to just do some jerry rigging here. So I want to tie this up quite a bit. Uh, this loom uh, goes up here. It's all the buttons to control the starting and stopping of the engine. And that's in good shape. So I got to re-tidy this all up 
secure this a bit and then start to wire all these switches in. There's a lot to go on in here and really I'm sure it would just be painful to watch me uh, putting zip ties on and terminals. So I'll check in with you uh, after this is tidied up a bit. I don't mind acknowledging that this is quite a rat's nest and to do it neatly is quite a challenge. Okay. There's actually a system here. Can you tell? All right then, well, just back from getting my booster jab and we'll dive right back in. My goodness, it is seriously, seriously windy out there. Okay, more wires, more wires. All right then, well, good morning. This has been <laughs> a bit of a process. To be fair, I have redesigned the layout in here two or three times in the last 48 hours. Uh, it's not done, it's not tidy. This is my arch nemesis, uh, but I have a solution for it I just can't employ today. Anyway, the basic wiring from inside the helm is done. Let me give you a little bit of, well, let me tidy up and give you a little bit of a tour. All right, this isn't something I'm proud of yet, but I'm actually relatively pleased with the way it's coming. It's got quite a ways to go. I mean, you will all recognize the mess of all the predetermined connectors and pigtails from these speed hut gauges and I think I have a solution to tidy them up into there, but because I can't short them because they all have connectors on them, it's a bit of a problem. I'm much happier with the way I've snaked all the um, heavy cables down to the engine sensors. That's pretty good. Uh, of course, this uh, harness for the engine start controls and the relays, uh, the latching relay and stuff for the ignition worked out very well. And actually, this is tighter than I would have thought. That's fully wired with the exception of two switches that are not yet allocated and uh, I'll go over what these do in a second. Uh, in terms of the stuff in the bottom here, um, this uh, terminal strip here is the main power in, uh, so all the feeds, in other words, uh, this is the helm controls, uh, helm feed, uh, I have a few spares, and here we have um, lights, horn, wipers, things like that, which go back to circuits on the main panel. A big uh, ground bus, a terminal strip to connect all the switches to the wires they're going to go to, and this is a terminal strip that goes to the engine. So we have the sensors that are not part of the main harness, which will include things like the over temp and uh, under pressure for both the engine and the transmission and uh, alarms. And they're going to be set up to these pigtails here, which I haven't talked about much, but these are the little warning lights that are on the helm that I've added recently. All that and a little plastic protector to make sure that nothing gets caught in the steering chain. That would be ugly. In fact, I'm probably going to improve upon this. Anyway, let's close it up. Now all these wires should nicely just fold up and under past the USB, past that, up on the new shelf. There we go. Excellent. 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 Obviously there is some springing here because of that big bundle of wires off the gauges, but that's going to be improved. Actually, I'm really, really happy with this. Woohoo! So here are those um, new um, warning lights that are going to be ideally connected up. This is engine temperature, so this should go off when the engine temperature uh, exceeds a comfortable range. That's relatively straightforward. This is engine oil pressure, also very similar. This is uh, my charging light, also very sim simple. Basically, it goes on if the engine's not charging. Uh, this is the hardest one. Because I'm using a uh, NMEA 2000 depth sounder, I wanted an alarm. There'll be an audible alarm as well as a light alarm if the depth gets below it. But I haven't been able to figure out in the programming of that how to access that just yet. But hopefully I will. All right, and the switches. I'll tell you what these are all for. This is the windless up and down. This is a... Um, uh, anchor wash. In other words, it'll be um, a deck wash uh, high pressure at the anchor to wash that off. Next down is uh, riding lights, navigation lights, anchor light, spotlight. These two are unallocated. This is the wiper and I'm looking for a two position switch for here. In other words, a three position off on on. Very uncommon in North America, quite common in the UK. So if anyone knows of a off on on um, supplier for a toggle switch, I'd be very grateful. This is the windshield washer and it's spring loaded as I mentioned earlier. And this is the horn spring loaded as I mentioned earlier. You know, I'm kind of liking these actually as switches. I thought maybe I'd put the same push buttons I have here um, over here, but I, I don't know. We'll see how that all goes. Neat and everything is wired up and works. I'm actually very pleased with this. 
Now, I know what you're saying. Peter, you did that almost a year ago. Why weren't you pleased with it then? Well, I was, but I knew there was a bit of jury rigging going on there. And everything that's in there now, with the exception of that harness, is bulletproof and ready to go. So I can build on it. And it's taken days to actually do that. And I still haven't dealt with... Yeah, that's coming. Let's go meet somebody. All right then, it's raining, it's cold, I'm up for some comfort food, and one of my favorites is fish cakes. Shall we get on with it? Okay, this is by no means a guaranteed recipe, it's just the way I do it, and I do it a little bit different every time. It's partly inspired by some Newfoundland friends I had back in Nova Scotia, and I'll tell you which parts are. Anyway, uh, there's about a pound of uh, West Coast um, cod, which is ling cod out here, a little less of potato, an onion, a good chunk of bacon, some eggs, buck, and, uh, butter, cream, sour cream. Anyway, you'll, you'll see it all go together. Okay, I'm going to start with getting these potatoes peeled and starting to boil uh, because they need to be pre-cooked just a little bit. Uh, well, not a little bit, a reasonable amount because they'll only be fried at the end for a few minutes. So we want to get them not, you know, mashed potato soft, but boiled potato soft. Is that a thing? <laughs> All right, we get that water boiling. And while the water's boiling, I'm just going to prepare the fish to um, uh, cook in a little bit of butter and cream. Again, this is a technique that I was taught by a, uh, a Nova Scotian who was a very fine um, fish cook. And uh, so we're just going to put a little butter in this pan and then a little cream. So we'll start the other burner here. And in with some butter. Maybe not quite that much. Yeah, about there. There we go. All right, just as the butter starts to sizzle a little bit, we can drop in this fish. And um, only some of it will actually really get to be, you know, a little bit of uh, butter frying in the bottom. And then uh, the rest of it. Oh, that smells good. We're going to drench in some cream just enough to sort of not exactly cover it but yeah, there we go about that much and that'll get hot and basically just as that comes to a boil uh, we got to take it off again because we don't want to burn the cream and let it just sort of kind of continue to cook in a little bit Oh, folks, things are getting going and I forgot my apron. Yes, I now have an apron or two to cook in, uh, which is great because I'm not the tidiest of cook. It's got pockets. Okay, this fish is just coming to a boil. So I'm just going to rotate it around a little bit and uh, let that soak up some of that lovely creamy goodness. In this process, I'll be breaking it up a little bit. So what I'm looking here for here is texture. Basically, the fish, when it's raw, well, it's raw. It's kind of gelatinous, you know. And fish, when it's cooked, it becomes a little firmer. But I don't want it to get dry or hard. Um, the cream has a lot to do with that. Um, so I can just sort of tell that, you know, once it's, it starts to get approaching cooked, it gets firmer. Of course, it's also going to be fried in the pan later. So there's no, no risk here. Let's turn that down just a hair. And the potato water is just about to come to a boil. So I'm just going to slice these into some sort of reasonable sized pieces so they cook just a hair quicker. All right. That'll be boiling in just a moment. And it's time for the onion. Um, again, a lot of recipes for um, fish cakes and such um, uh, don't pre-cook the onion. Uh, but I like my onion just slightly caramelized so that it can be uh, a little more flavor coming out of it. Having a bit of a mess here trying to skin it. All right, the fish is just starting to firm up, and uh, which means I can take it off and it'll continue to cook while it's resting and before we actually put it in the mix. And I can turn this small burner back up again and move the potatoes over because they're really starting to move along because I need to get a frying pan going here with some more butter <laughs> for the onions. All right, with that butter nicely sizzling along there, I turn that down a bit and get these onions in. Now I can be accused of uh, having a tendency to 
over caramelized onions. In other words, I love caramelized onions so much, I basically caramelize them for almost everything I cook. Uh, but it's just not required for this because we're not going to get uh, that flavor out of it. So I think on the cooking shows they say, just translucent. Well, we're not quite there. I think while these are frying, I'm going to have a beer chef's entitled to a drink. This is uh, from Hawaii, actually. It's Gold Coast IPA. Uh, a friend of mine brought it over. We had it at Christmas. Quite tasty. Cheers. Hmm. Hawaiian-y. I'm going to say these potatoes have to be pretty close to there. Uh, again, my technique for telling is sort of by hitting them with the fork. I don't necessarily stab them. I just sort of tap on them. And you can kind of tell when they go from hard to not so hard. And these are uh, approaching not so hard. And in with the bacon. I just use scissors to kind of chop them into little bacony bitty size. I think this is a trick I learned from Lady Z. Oh, that smells good. Now this being exceptionally lean bacon, there's no fat to drain off here. Ah, just lovely. Alright then, now to just mix it all up. Uh, obviously we'll start with the potatoes, which are hot. So uh, I'm going to have, have my hands in here in a bit, but not just yet. Okay, and then uh, comes the fish, which again has been um, sort of cooking in this cream. Now I don't want all the cream in here yet, because I don't know how wet I want it to be. So I would use a slotted spoon if I had one. I'm just going to use this potato masher to kind of pull the fish out and over. But I'm not going to throw this cream away just yet, because if I find it a little dry, well that's the liquid of choice. Okie dokie. And finally, the bacon and onions. Well, not quite finally, but this is the bulk of the uh, ingredients. One egg. One healthy dope of sour cream. Yes, believe it or not, sour cream. And if I was in Nova Scotia, I would be filling this up with something called summer savory. In the absence of that, I'm going to use a good healthy load of oregano. And because there's no way I'm going to get my hands in here just yet, I'll just start uh, to mix this up with this spatula. Just get it. Potatoes chopped enough that they'll start to bind together a little bit. Now you don't want it a puree. You want to be able to sense the individual chunks, especially the fish. So I don't want to go too far with that. Excellent. This now gets transferred to the fridge for about half an hour. Uh, this time of year, this will just go outside into the cockpit. Okay, with the batter cooled off, here comes the sticky part. And because it's going to be sticky, I'm just going to put a little flour down on the board here where I'm going to place them. So we'll slightly reduce the likelihood of stickage. Uh, although uh, <laughs> I have a feeling this batter is a bit sticky. Well, not too, too bad. All right. Okay, so let's see if we can make... I think we're going to do six patties for tonight. Six cakes. Nice thing about this is that you can refrigerate the remaining uh, batter, dough, mixture, whatever you want to call this, uh, for another night. I don't know if you can freeze it. I don't have the authority to be able to make that statement for sure. It's amazing how many fish and potato meals there are. Of course, the 20 years or so I lived in the Maritimes, I was exposed to more than a few um, other than the sort of traditional uh, fish and chips. Uh, of course, fish cakes being one of them, but there's many, many others. Fish chowder, which I'll make for you soon. I make a pretty wicked fish chowder. And then there's just a number of Newfoundland um, fish and potato, fish and taters. Basically, as I cook this fish in cream, um, it was stolen from some fish and taters uh, recipes that I've been exposed to. Okay, that's that. Yuck. All right, if you thought that was messy, here comes the real messy part, which is the uh, egg wash and breadcrumb uh, mix. I'm doing these in a plate because uh, down in a bowl, it is hard to reach down with a very sticky um, fish cake. So we'll just whip this up in here a little bit. Aren't these lovely eggs? These are from our local butcher. Uh, of course, I have no idea where they get them, but they're the most lovely eggs I have ever, ever seen. 
Something I learned about way too late in life is the wet hand, dry hand technique of um, egg wash breadcrumbs. In other words, you keep one hand wet and one hand dry. And uh, what a difference that makes in uh, keeping this sort of a reasonable process. All right then, I don't mind admitting that these are just a little on the soft side, but they'll, they'll be delicious. All right, let's get this pan hot. And to fry these, we're gonna very shallow fry them in a combination of butter and uh, grapeseed oil. Um, butter because it's delicious, grapeseed oil because it'll raise the smoking point a little bit and uh, increase the economy just ever so slightly. All right. All right, it's getting good and hot. Oh, a nice yummy combination. Let's slide a couple of these in here. Oh, so beautiful. Oh my gosh, that is smelling so wonderful. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Just about there. Okay, let's get these over. Now, flipping large flat things in boiling oil is a bit precarious. You want to make sure it doesn't splatter back down. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> All right, we've got some plates warming on the other burner here. And those are ready to go. And let's do our other three. Oh, yeah. Just got to try one little bite. Welcome to the Travels with Jordy Beer of the Week. The days technically are getting longer, but boy, it sure seems to get dark early. Okay, let's get straight to the beer. It's White Sails Bastion Blonde. It's a blonde ale from White Sail Brewery, and uh, I've never had this before, which is great. Let's see what we think. Wiring. I'm sort of getting tired of wiring, and to be fair, you guys probably are too. I'm going to try and knuckle down and get finished in the next week or so, um, we're over the worst of it. Cheers. White Sail Blonde. You'd think a blonde ale would be fairly innocuous, but that doesn't taste very good. I'm trying to see if it'll grow on me. No, it won't. Um. It's still perfectly suitable for cheersing though. Um, and of course the first person uh, I'd like to congratulate is Lauren McNabb, who was last week's winner of a Travels with Jordy t-shirt. So Lauren, get a hold of me and we'll make sure you get your t-shirt. Um, I want to thank two new Patreons ever so much. Uh, David Elvin and Jeremy Camel. Thank you ever so much for coming aboard. I'm so grateful. Mm. And um, off the Amazon wish list, I one of these snazzy little um, blue sea uh, circuit breaker lockouts. What this does is it creates a little door that will basically cover up the circuit breaker. And many people have asked about this. And yes, I'm going to put this over. Well, that's why I put it on the wish list. A few of these, at least the bilge pumps, because for sure I don't want bilge pumps being knocked off and possibly some other circuits. So um, that's super handy. And again, it didn't come with any sort of indication who sent it. So if you did, please let me know so I can thank you properly. Cheers, whoever you are. I'd also like to send out a very special thank you to my good friend Lloyd. Most of you will remember him uh, with the beautiful little 28-foot monk poem. Anyway, he was kind enough to set me up with a new laptop. Oh my gosh, so grateful. Uh, my 12-year-old desktop is just at the end of being able to edit, so um, that is very, very, very much appreciated. Thank you ever so much, Lloyd. Cheers. Mm. And all we need now and it's pretty obvious. The word of the week this week will be wiring. I'm so done with wiring, but if you can think something clever to say with it, I'd be very grateful. Cheers, see you next week. Wiring.